Good morning and welcome to Hellhurst United Church. It's the first Sunday in Lent and we're so glad you're joining us. Today we'll be looking at the soul of creation and uh, hear the story of the importance of the rainbow uh, set in the sky. Uh, we welcome Bill Phipps who will join us uh, and through the words and music of this service we hope that you feel you are not alone as you step into the private and public life of Lent this year. Welcome to Hillhurst United Church this morning. Hillhurst United Church has uh, four core practices, hospitality. Whether you're watching first thing Sunday morning or throughout the week, we hope you have the right beverage to settle yourself into the morning. Uh, the second practice is spirituality. This church has a programs going on throughout the week. We trust that you'll delve into the nurture of your soul in the programming this week. And then the call to action is what social justice is. How do we take the Bible and the newspaper, or Bible and iPhone together and actively engage in the events of the world? And it's all deeply grounded in risk. So welcome to the four practices of Hillhurst United Church as we journey into Lent. We welcome you this morning, and it's so important for us to share what's going on. Uh, when this church opened, they said a seven day a week church is opening in, in Kensington. And for sure that's the case as we move into Lent. So we wanna share some of the good news that's happening this week to engage you in your faith community. So it was a big day yesterday, John, right? Big day. We had over 70 people show up to be part of what we call Calling Hillhurst Home, which is um, an online gathering that we created during the pandemic so that people can be new members of the Hillhurst United Church. I don't know if I would have thought about it a year ago if I would have understood that we would have had new members during a pandemic, but we have over 70 people joining the church, which is really exciting for me. So um, it was a day of learning, connection, welcoming new members, and um, I'm really excited about it. I just, I'm, I'm proud of the church for actually, and I'm really proud of people for wanting to be part of the church. So um, the new members will be recognized at our congregational meeting, which is happening on Thursday at uh, seven o'clock p.m. Um, in addition to the new memberships, we'll be talking about the building, which is going to be really exciting, um, showing some video and uh, renderings of the, of the new building, and then also talking about the washrooms, and then going over some financial uh, business for the budget. It's really important uh, to engage in that, so we welcome you to that meeting on Thursday evening. Uh, we also are in Lent, and there's something happening every day. So go to uh, find our Lenten guide to find out what would be helpful to you to nurture your soul and engage you fully in Lent, uh, hillhurstunited.life. And also, as we are in Black History Month, we're exploring and expanding our understanding through conversation and learning together. And I want to invite you to the uh, chat where you're at as we are taking steps to be an anti-racist church. Um, today, Tony Snow, our Indigenous min Minister from Chinook Winds, will be leading with us a conversation with Keitha uh, Awego, uh, for a free Methodist uh, minister here in Calgary. I think that this move towards diversity and inclusion is actually part of the bigger story of the church's reemergence. And I think sometimes that it goes back to this idea of, um, you know, in I believe it's Nehemiah, where it says, not, not in my strength or power but by the spirit but but it kind of goes back to this idea and, and we all have the tendency to do it is that we want to build something by our strength and we want to build something by our power and we want to build something by our strategy but there is something powerful about leaning into the spirit because the spirit moves in the way that the spirit moves and so the spirit is never going to move the church away from inclusivity the spirit is never going to move the church away from diversity. The spirit is never going to move us away from one another. So a chance afterwards to engage in conversation with others. So go to the chat where you're at after church this morning. Have a good week. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. Hillhurst United Church is an inclusive community of faith, following in the way of Jesus under the banner. Whoever you are, wherever you're at, join us on the journey. Celebrating over 11 years as an affirming congregation, we're a community that not only accepts each other as we are, but welcomes and celebrates the ministry and participation of all persons. Whatever your age, whatever your gender identity, 
Whatever your gender expression. Whatever your health status. Whatever your race. Whatever your sexual orientation. Whatever your ability. Whatever your religious background. Whatever your ethnic background. Whatever your economic circumstances. Know you are loved. Know God loves you. And we hope you'll feel welcome here at Hillhurst United Church. In our community of faith, we also, as part of our tradition, is a reminder that we are on Treaty 7 land. And we celebrate and give thanks for the indigenous people and their stories, their ways of walking and living on the land prior to us being here. And their traditions, their spiritual understanding helps us deepen our connection one to another as we seek to be treaty people. And so we recognize the people of the Siksika, Pekani, Kainai, Sutina, and Stony Nakoda First Nations, recognizing that indigenous people have walked this land before us and their traditions inspire and deepen our own as we seek to live and honor a treaty people nation. And so all of us are welcome to Hillhurst United For some this week, it was easy to find greatness in God's creation. And for others, it was difficult to find goodness in everyday life. Let us center ourselves to enter into the sacred space called prayer. Spirit, in the beginning of time, your spirit moved over the waters of creation and brought forth life. Descend and move this day as we open our hearts and mind.
from the beginning of scripture and the book of Genesis, right through every book to the final one, the book of Revelation, we are reminded that God is creator, that God loves, that God desires relationship with us, and that we are loved, forgiven, and set free. May we dare to believe this great good news. We are loved, we are forgiven, and we are set free. Thanks be to God for this great good news. This is an opportunity for us and for you to share. Normally we would have a time of offering where you'd have a chance to uh, go to the back and make an offering online or bring a gift to the front and move about and greet one another. Sadly, we can't do that, but we do set aside time in our service for you to offer your gift, whether you're living right here in Calgary or somewhere around the world. If this online ministry is important to you and you are able, we welcome you to offer your gift this time. Our offering will now be received. On Monday evening in our spiritual nurture program, uh, we began our Soul Of series that takes us through Lent. Each uh, Monday evening, we'll be exploring a different aspect of soul. And we kicked it off this week with the soul of creation. And as I was thinking about it, I thought, uh, let's gather uh, Bill Phipps. Bill Phipps is a congregant of our church. He's also a former moderator, and he has a deep passion for creation and for climate change. And so he spoke uh, for about 10 minutes on Monday evening and it was very powerful. So I asked him, would you come and share that good news with us? And the invitation to look at spirituality and ethics together. What's the soul of the work uh, around climate change? So I invite you to hear now uh, this great message that Bill shared with us on Monday evening. The soul of creation is the mysterious, ineffable, loving energy which initiates and embraces all life forms into beautiful interdependence and endless possibility. The soul of creation is the seed and the grounding of all wonder, mystery, and life itself. The soul of creation is the fundamental spark of holy mystery of Mother Earth, of beauty beyond human imagining. The soul of creation is the wonder, hope, complex reality into which human life is born, sister and brother with all living things, seen and unseen. The soul of creation is infinite divine blessing and holy wisdom. 
You see, I believe that we are embedded with all living things in this sacred creation. And therefore, as Mary Oliver says, the only question is how to love this world. The only question is how to love this world. Well, we all know that the climate crisis that humankind is facing, we know that humankind is forgetting how to love the earth. And not only that, we have forgotten that Mother Earth is our only planet, our only place of home. And, on, and we depend on her for everything. Listen to Cherokee elder Scott Momenday. We humans must come again to a moral comprehension of the earth and air. We must live according to a land ethic. The alternative is that we shall not live at all. Or put even more simply by Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh in his beautiful love letter to the earth. He says this, a spiritual revolution is needed if we are going to confront the environmental challenges that we face. A spiritual revolution is needed if we are to confront the environmental challenges we face. Now, we all know that the climate crisis is a political question. It's economic, it's cultural, it's scientific, it's technological, all those things. But if we do not address the spiritual and ethical dimensions, there is little hope. Technology and innovation alone, although very important, will not save us. Now, I am encouraged these days, much more encouraged than I was a few years ago, that more and more scientific people and political and economic people are recognizing and naming the climate crisis as a spiritual matter, as an ethical revolution and they're coming to see these dimensions as essential as we address the climate crisis. Now that revolution is grounded in the gratitude and the blessing of the soul of creation. In Braiding Sweetgrass, Robin Kimmerer asks this question, how in our modern world can we find our way to understand the earth as gift again, as gift again, to make our relations with the world sacred again. So you see, faith traditions and their community, such as this one, are absolutely essential as we seek to address the climate crisis. This is our moment. This is the moment that spiritual and ethical communities need to step up. It is our time a time of reckoning, a time of transformation, a spiritual time, a time of hope. Now for me, the ethical question in all of this is this one. To what does Mother Earth say we are entitled? To what does Mother Earth say we are entitled? She is to be loved, not plundered. Listen to Mother Earth crying, bleeding, her soul yearning for care, for respect, for healing, for love. The soul of creation is mother to our soul. So the call for you know, in the climate crisis is a call to our soul to wake up, to arise and become lovers of all things once again. Now, before I close, I need to mention one reality which I feel very strongly is at the heart of the actions we need to undertake. And these two things are consumed, well, they're one thing, consumerism and consumption. A while ago in the Guardian Weekly uh, newspaper, John Vidal wrote, the way to avoid ecological disaster is to starve the beast of consumerism. Now here in Alberta, 
we are becoming very aware of the dangers facing our rivers because the rivers that flow from the eastern slopes in the southern part of Alberta that flow through southern Alberta into Saskatchewan and Manitoba are facing great danger as more coal mining is contemplated in those beautiful Rocky Mountains. And we understand the danger our rivers are facing. So I ask, may we remember that the Bible begins and ends with stories about rivers. In the Garden of Eden in Genesis, there are four rivers that flow out of the Garden of Eden into the whole world to nurture life. And then in the book of Revelation, at the end of the Bible, the river of life flows through into the city of God, to the very heart of the city, and nurtures the tree of life, which stands at the city center. So therefore, a spiritual revolution of the soul. Rabbi Abraham Heschel tells us that our goal should be to live in radical amazement. Isn't that a great phrase? To live in radical amazement. And when we do that, creations and our souls will rejoice. May it be so. Amen. Let us pray. Spirit, as we begin our Lenten journey, may we see signs of your presence. May we hear the right word, see the right thing, know the right knowing as we journey. Be with us, we pray. Amen. Today is the first Sunday in Lent. For those of you for whom this may be a new experience, the word Lent comes from the word Lent lengthening, Lent. It leans towards spring. It's the 40 days that we journey toward Easter. It's a reminder that we come from the ground and we return to the ground. And nothing from our beginning to our end can separate us from God's love. In the church, we ritualize this with Ash Wednesday. And on Ash Wednesday, we have the ashes marking our forehead to remind us of this Lenten journey and the call to return to the earth from whence we came. On Wednesday, we gathered as a church on Zoom to have our Ash Wednesday service. It was so great to see the faces of our community online. There were people from here there were friends from BC and Manitoba and Ontario, and their faces lit up the room as we embarked together on the beginning of the Lenten journey. And I confess that night that I actually love Lent. I mentioned that last year we were in the Lentiest of Lents, and this year, a year after COVID, we were stepping into the Lentiest Lent we ever Lented. Sounds like a Dr. Zeus book the Lentiest Lent we ever Lented. After a year of living with COVID, there's some of us who are saying, just get me to Easter, let's skip Lent. But I love Lent. I love the intention of Lent. It's a time where we pause and we descend to our soul. It's a time of reflection, a time of discernment. 
a time of confession, a time of repentance. I remembered with the community on Ash Wednesday that in my last church community, there was a woman who on the last Sunday of Epiphany would go out the door of the church and say, see at Easter, I'm giving up Lent for Lent. Maybe that's how you feel this year. Let's just get to Easter. Can we just bring the tulips in? Let's just skip Lent. But the truth is there's no skipping Lent, just like there's no skipping the cross. The Christian journey is one that journeys into the shadow, into the darkness, into the world of our soul to look more clearly in the mirror. Lent is an important part of our faith journey. I didn't say this on Ash Wednesday, but I'm saying it today. There's, there's two aspects to Lent that are so important to understand. There is a personal Lenten journey. That is the private side of Lent. It's a time in Lent when we consider, who am I? It's time when I look at my regrets and my mistakes and I let them go. It's a time to consider the present and the kind of future I hope for. It's not a beating one up and making one feel bad with guilt and shame. No, it is simply an honest, personal look in the mirror at our life, recognizing our mortality. There's a personal side to Lent, but there's also a public side of Lent. The public side of Lent is an opportunity to look into the the public sphere in which we all live and move, to look at the systems we live and move in, to examine systems of racial injustice, to consider my place in the environment, to learn through reading and discussion so that I might have more awareness. There's an engagement in the public ways that Lent invites me. So there's both the private and the public that Lent invites us to, and we journey toward Easter with the private and public together. Lent has that call of private and public, and it's a call of the soul. So no wonder the scripture that we're looking at today begins with the book of Genesis. The very first book called Genesis means the beginning, and it looks literally at the creation story. Now, when I say literally, I would say this. We we look at the Bible seriously, but not literally, but looks at how it all began. How did it start? What's our connection to creation? And the book of Genesis begins with two creation stories. I love that the Bible holds two different stories, two different ways of understanding how it all began. Seven times God says to herself, it is good. It is good, it is good seven times and ends up saying finally, it is very good as she puts her feet up and looks at the beauty that she has created. And then the story moves on in Genesis to the Garden of Eden, the the mythology of that, that garden story where we hear about Adam whose name in Hebrew means earth and Eve, her name means life, the story of earth life in the garden. And I love in that story, the the first question God poses to them in the garden is, where are you? Where are you? What a great question God asks you and I, where are we? And then the story moves on to the story of Cain and Abel. And and you discover that Cain is violent with kills his brother Abel. It's it's a violent story in creation. It's kind of like Peaky Blinders on steroids. Violence is everywhere. And I imagine God, kind of like the wife in the Herman cartoon, wearing a bathrobe and curlers in her hair. She sits back in her lazy boy chair and she's sipping coffee and she looks down at all this violence and she's furious and she goes, this is ridiculous. I said it was good. This is not good what I am seeing these human beings. And in a bit of a temper tantrum, she says, I'm going to wipe all these people out with a flood, except Noah. And so God warns Noah and says, get yourselves together, your family, and build an ark, build a boat. I need you to put two of everything on, and and there's going to be a flood. And with that warning, Noah begins the building of the ark, and the flood comes. And for 40 days and 40 nights, he's out over the water until finally a dove returns 
reminding him that there is dry land. The ark bumps up on the land. He stumbles out, falls on his knees, and builds an altar on this dry land. As God is watching from above, she, she says to herself, that's it, what was I thinking? Never again will I ever do that again. Never, five times she said, never again will I flood the earth in such a way. And so she says to herself, what am I going to do to remind myself? What will I do to remind myself never to do this again, to never destroy the earth? And she looks and she sees out of the corner of her eye a rainbow. And so she places in the sky a bow. Interestingly enough, the bow is a sign of violence, a sign of war. She takes the bow, the sign of violence, and places it in the sky, the rainbow, as a sign that she will bring peace, that she will not destroy, that God, the creator of all, will be in relationship with us to cultivate and take care of creation. I love that God needs a reminder. I need a sticky note or a reminder on my phone, but God needs a bow in the sky to remind God not to destroy again. The rainbow is a sign that God will not intervene in such a way ever. God will never destroy ever. Five times God says never again, never again, never again, never again, never again. The public sign in the sky is a rainbow, a sign of God's presence, not power, creation, not destroying. I love that God needs a reminder that God looks at the rainbow for God's self to remind God, whenever God's tempted to, to mess things up, God looks at the rainbow and says, never again. The bow in the cloud, you see, we think it's for us, but it's actually for God, for God to be reminded, to remember, to be faithful, to be in covenant relationship. The rainbow is a sign of God's presence in the world. A number of years ago, when I was in a class at Princeton Theological Seminary, the professor came into the class and said, what do you make of the fact that humans have the capability of destroying the earth? A quiet came over the room, and a woman put up her hand and said, I'm not worried about that at all. God will just make another one. I was stunned at her apathy that led me to write a, a letter in the Princeton Theological Seminary newspaper called The Sin of Apathy. Isn't that the case for so many, putting it off on God but not taking the responsibility for ourselves to seek peace, for ourselves to take care of the planet and every living creature? Clearly, this text reminds us that God loves every living creature. God loves creation and calls us to love creation too. The public aspect of Lent calls us to action, calls us to love. A writer I read this week says of this text, this text, this story is the quintessential biblical passage for a full and rich environmental theology. God loves the cosmos and works for its ongoing success and bids all of those who love God to love the cosmos too, and to join God in good environmental work. So what do we make of this Lent, this Lenty of Lents that we're in? I believe this Lentiest of Lent calls us to be a rainbow, to be a rainbow in our private and public life. You're all on your computers more than you usually were, I think. And I wonder if this is a time when, when you might be a good public theologian and, and write a love letter to your MLA to tell them that you love the earth, to encourage them to love the earth too, to love the earth with policy and action for a sustainable future for all. Be a rainbow. Or when you're about to use violent words or actions, pause and be a rainbow. Or when you're judging too harshly another, about to be violent yourself, pause and be a rainbow. 
Or when you're lazy and disengaged, maybe you'll yawn and pause and step up and be a rainbow. When you're hard on yourself, feeling like you're not good enough, may you pause and breathe and maybe be a rainbow for yourself. When you know there's someone out there who could use a phone call or a text or a message, maybe you could pause and be a rainbow. You see, I believe Lent calls us to be a rainbow in the world, to be a light, to be color, to be God's presence with our hands, feet, and voice. Brian Meeks, theologian, says, life is a gift and love is the point. The rainbow is a sign of nonviolence. It's a call to be present and a call to be loving. We are called to be a rainbow this Lent. On Ash Wednesday morning, my 10-year-old daughter was going out the door and she said to me, Dad, what are you giving up for Lent? I was surprised she even knew. I said, I don't know. I'll tell you later, and I walked off to work. I thought about it all day, and I've got an answer that I'm gonna share with Charlotte. Charlotte, this year in COVID-19 is the Lentiest of Lents, and it's a challenging time. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm giving up my negativity, my fear, and my cynicism. I'm gonna try to be a rainbow. How about you? Amen. There's an African-American song, 19th century, which um, is so great. It says, when it looked like the sun wasn't gonna shine anymore, God put a rainbow in the clouds. Imagine. And I've had so many rainbows in my clouds. I had a lot of clouds, but I have had so many rainbows. And one of the things I do when I step up on a stage, when I stand up to translate, when I go to teach my classes, when I go to direct a movie, I bring everyone who has ever been kind to me with me. Black, white, Asian, Spanish-speaking, Native American, gay, straight, everybody. I say, come with me. I'm going on the stage. Come with me. I need you now. Long dead. You see? So I don't ever feel I have no help. I've had rainbows in my clouds. And the thing to do, it seems to me, is to prepare yourself so that you can be a rainbow in somebody else's cloud. Somebody who may not look like you, may not call God the same name you call God, if they call God at all, <laughs> you see? And may not eat the same dishes prepared the way you do, may not dance your dances or speak your language, but be a blessing to somebody. That's what I think.
So we welcome you to uh, the chat where you're at in a few moments. I want to thank uh, Bill and our music people uh, and the video clips that enhance our worship service. So we heard the call. You are called to be a rainbow. Uh, this month, uh, as we journey through Lent, may you find opportunities that you can embody compassion and peace and love in your life. So go this day knowing that we are loved we are set free in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all. Amen.